When the sun sets, the undead awaken. To slake their hunger, they feed upon the herd of unaware mortals. Right beneath our noses, the kindred clash against their rivals as they vie for control of the city of San Francisco. Are you strong enough to cheat final death and see another night? Vampire the Masquerade Rivals Expandable Card Game from Renegade Game Studios. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Vampire Wednesday. As usual, I am Matt Holland here talking about Vampire the Masquerade Rivals Expandable Card Game. We talked about Gen Con last week. And to this week, I am here with the Prince of Indianapolis, Josh Johnson himself. Josh, how are you doing tonight? Oh, pretty good. Still recovering from Gen Con. Still recovering. Getting ready for Origins, yeah. Oh, you're going to Origins too. And they put them a little close together for my liking, but... I I, I can sympathize there. I I do not uh, regret not having to go to both of those in a row. Um, Josh... How does it feel? You've been enjoying your your throne, your reign so far. Uh, yeah, like immediately after it was over, I my brain just kind of like flew out of my body, and like uh, we, we did like a pod, and I'm like doing like a dumb thing or two, and they're like, "Oh yeah, and you're the prince." I'm like, "Hey, all pressure is off now. I'm just having fun." Like, <laughs> there you go. You you you've earned the title, and you don't need to worry about it for you know another year. There, I can I can understand. That's having only now played a couple of multiplayer games of rivals, having played mostly two player, it definitely seems like it can be mentally taxing to track the additional sort of game state elements of more players and the poly inner table politics too. Yeah. And some of the games, like the, you can tell like some of the players were a bit newer, like there wasn't a lot of politics going on. Mm-hmm. Then, like the the final, one, I felt like it, it was really clicking, and hopefully, like as everyone gets more experienced, it'll it'll be like the average game. Yeah. Sure, sure. And with the Swiss, Swiss, I think we started to filter that up towards the later rounds. But even with the the caveat that with four players, uh, pairing to not have match pairings gets really tricky. So you'll have a lot of pairing up and pairing down. Yeah, it, it was very impressive to yeah not. I have to see like any is so the same table as anyone bearing the Swiss. So just... Well, I'm I'm glad that it worked out and was a good experience for you. So, Josh, you this is not your first card game. You have played other sort of like similar living expandable card games in the past, right? Can, can you talk a little bit about that experience and what you've done? In uh, them? I think my most exten- extensive was uh, Star Wars, where uh, I played throughout its whole run. Uh, I got a card design in that as well. Uh, that did fairly well. Um, I dabbled a bit in uh, Game of Thrones mm-hmm. and uh, played L5R through its whole duration and uh, co-ops, both Lord of the Rings and a lot of Marvel lately. So. Awesome. So you're, you've been playing a lot of card games like this and found Rivals to kind of be a new, a new flavor to try out? Yeah, if I don't have to buy packs, I'm happy I'll play the game. There you go. Randy and uh, are you are you familiar familiar with World of Darkness before you started playing Rivals, or was this kind of your first step in? Yeah, I uh, I played the role playing game back in second edition throughout like its duration all the way up through uh, Gehenna, and then uh, when they went to the new edition where ones no longer botched and eights were successes, we dabbled in that a bit, but all my dice were rolling seven, so it was kind of miserable. So we kind of moved on to other games. I got gotcha. you. Cool. So, so yeah, this I played is a lot of, lot of World of Darkness. Actually, my uh, like my online handle was my longtime Asimite character in uh, Letux, and that was mainly because like I always hated naming a character during the role playing session. So I just like rolled a d twenty, rolled a d six, and had those be like consonant vowels, and that's where the Letux comes up. Oh, and that worked out relatively well. It's not just total gibberish. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we, it was really nice seeing a lot of people that I have seen at other card game events showing up at playing uh, Rivals at Gen Con. You know, and nice to see some familiar faces and see some people who have you know, moved on to this new game with Rivals. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your experience at the tournament. So uh, let's talk about the deck first, I think, because that's going to color any other discussion. Uh, your deck, I thought, was kind of cool because 
you ran the hunt the hunter's agenda but you really didn't seem like you were always just trying to go for an agenda win correct uh it, so you really need to be able to get some agenda points in the table especially if you're trying to eliminate somebody because you could just like do a lot of work towards elimination and get them close mm -hmm. and then someone else could finish them off if you're not within like three points of them so you, you definitely need an agenda yeah and the hunt the hunters had the benefit of giving you money too so if someone was going after your money you could kind of stay alive a bit longer and that's that's what Matt Hyrus said on our stream last weekend and pointed out that I hadn't thought about the fact that Hunt the Hunters gives you prestige mm -hmm. is a defense against someone trying to drain you too. Mm -hmm. So it kind of serves both purposes. Um, and can you talk a little bit about we'll just go through the deck real quick here. So you had two steal the spotlight, one Seneschal, three beauty is a beast, three insanity defense, three dumpster dive, three backhand compliments. Three balance of power, three the last word, three faulty logic, three demand obedience, three enervate, three whisper campaign, three abiding comments, one everything is connected, two backup, and one heightened senses. So we've talked um, on the pod on the stream previously about the fact that frequently people will want to carry three of a card that they know they're going to want to have access to. It makes it much more consistent. So the threes are kind of self-explanatory. Can yeah, you talk a little bit about you lose money? <laughs> yeah, you brought three of everything that costs people prestige. Uh, yeah, three of the best cards. So for this game, it's like a card that you want to see in your hand all the time. You probably want three of. Um, dumpster dive can be like become any card that you need right then. So like if mm -hmm. someone's down to two bucks and you have a demand obedience in your hand, your turn could just be pick up the demand obedience then attack with it. You know. Sure. Um, so any of the money losses, I ran a three of. Um, some of the other ones may have been from not getting a ton of testing in. So like I just tried a few things out. Um, the defense cards, I just like insanity defense was the best to me. And then a lot of the rest, I just tried to like spread out and have a variety because some were better in some scenarios and some were better in others. Sure. What about um, the, the couple of one of So Seneschal and heightened senses and everything's connected. What was your logic? behind uh, just I, having the single copy um well heightened senses wasn't going to do a ton because it would only be for one but it's still like it could like extend the whole game a turn mm -hmm. i didn't want like a handful of them because i wasn't really saving people with it sure um but it would still work well on a pinch uh seneschal was like never a plan a for me because it takes a lot to put out uh, people can see it coming, it's very predictable, and it's burning an action on your turn. But sometimes, like, you just need it to push through. Uh, I didn't actually play it at all during the tournament. Oh, okay. The other ones of... And you have the uh, the last word in there, that's the influence modifier, correct? So you could, you could if you had that in hand, play Seneschal with... Uh, yeah, I could play Seneschal with that. And also that fueled uh, balance of power as well. Okay. To push those through. Uh, everything is connected. I just put in a one of because I have the three um, money drain conspiracies, and that can maybe pop those through a turn earlier. Or if I get two of them, sure. I can get some value. And if it was a lot of value, I could just pick it back up with a uh, dumpster dive. Yeah. I, I feel like having the dumpster dive is like going a little bit more toolboxy with variety stuff. Then I have like more options I can get back to. Yeah. That's nice. Uh, what was your sort of standout MVP card you think of the tournament? Um, or it's a, it could be a character, it could be a, a library card too. I don't know that there was one. Like I, I wasn't drawing a ton. I don't have any like real extra card draw. So I was just trying to make everything like no matter what kind of hand I found work. So you wanted to make the most of whatever you, your deck was designing, your play style was making the most of what you had rather than looking for critical components to a combo or something. Yeah, because like I had, you know, like a stack of cards that lost money. So I didn't rely on any specific one. I just tried to whichever one I find make work. There was a thing that I thought was kind of interesting that you did that you had talked about at the event. Uh, you have Lishu in there as a um, vampire. And you you just brought her, tell me if this is correct, as a way to basically bleed 
someone else who wanted to run her of a prestige or two. Yeah, so I had like my vampire slots were pretty flexible. Like I just had to have enough dominate to play demand obedience. Mm -hmm. And uh, so like the night before I put the two Tremere in and like I still had kind of a flex spot and I was uh, running Muhammad as a main just because like I wanted to be safe because I didn't think anyone else is going to start with Muhammad, even though I, I really like him personally. Sure. Um, so I'm like, hey, what if I just put Li Shu in? Like if I have her out, she's still great. Like she's still. Hits. Yes, you're not going to be sad like if she's your leader. Yeah, like her plus House of Pain still hits like a truck on anybody just about. Mm -hmm. Um and then if they try to start her, I get some free money off of them. And I'm very happy just going to Muhammad. And it worked out. I think I got extra money off of someone three times. Okay. So you ran Li Shu the other three games, presumably? Uh, yeah. So out of six games, I started Li Shu three times and Muhammad three times. Okay. And someone had to spend an extra dollar three times. And two of those times, including the final, they were my rival. I was going to say, how often was that your rival? Because that's really the, the ultimate value out of that. Yeah. And your thought, did you ever have, you know, running three different clans in your faction deck, did you ever run into situations where you had, you know, where you didn't have the vampires in play that you needed for the cards in your hand? Or were, or was, I, I don't know all the cards off the top of my head yet. I don't think the cards are super dependent on the vampires. You more chose them for their disciplines and maybe their abilities yeah, so i definitely need to dig and find a malkavian for um, insanity defense uh yeah and the dumpster dive and uh i think there's one other right and you've got three malkavians in there correct inmate lolita oh, and faulty logic yeah yeah um in hindsight velvet probably could have been the governor uh because in the final i ran into an issue where i was first player so i only had one starting vampire and then it was velvet which is the only other vampire that wasn't one of my starting vampires that didn't have um dominate mm -hmm. so i had the cards in my hand to end the game for a few turns i just didn't have the vampires on the table to play the demand obedience gotcha yeah. interestingly governor was the only what was one of the only 10 vampires that did not appear in the top 16 at all yeah he could have easily been in the velvet slot for me cool i, I was a little i thought money drain was going to be a bit more popular and she mitigates that a little bit so when you're playing this deck was there anything in particular that you were worried about seeing like whether just at the table that maybe you knew could win faster than you or that you were um, really worried about coming after you? If you don't mind, you know, sharing some- uh... Yeah, any, I mean, any deck really popping off could probably win fast. The, the thing I was most afraid of probably is if uh, the person, my prey was a scheme deck because they can, I had a scheme, a scheme deck that could just outsource my, like I could uh, get more money than I had component pieces easily. Sure things like uh velvet and then there's um the there's another money. vampire there's another vampire who gives you money every time like you play a scheme successfully yep. and yeah so I, I was a little worried about that because you're like never money draining them like if you know and they could start long-term plans but i didn't really see many people maybe i was just lucky in that aspect oh long-term investment right the, the one that it, yeah it, it reminds me of the melange mining corp from netrunner where you put the money on it and get money every turn yeah, yeah sort yeah. of yeah I, I love that one if you're if you're trying to spend a lot of money but yeah that's definitely not what you want to see when you're trying to bleed them dry yeah so there's a there's a lot of money gain and luckily i didn't run into a ton of it okay i don't know that there was a ton of that in the at least in the top 16 i didn't go through all of the decks because you know it's only been at this point one less than one week since we got back from gen con um usually the it's usually the scheming decks that can switch into gaining money real easy uh or they could even do the should everyone gain three bucks like yeah that that's uh free money i think yeah yep and that one's easy to get other people in on because yeah if they're if they're not your if they're not your rival what do you care if they get three dollars and you get it as well so yeah it's good because if there is a money drain deck at the table and it's not you then it's going to take them longer to win yep yeah and, and you don't other than that uh what was it the last word you don't really have any good ways to generate additional influence to combat any of those correct 
Um, yeah, I mean, the there's like a little bit of money gains between like balance of power and um, I just want to make sure I'm not messing names up. Sorry. And, and whisper campaign can like in faulty logic, I can steal a, a little bit towards myself. But. Sure. But your 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 native influence is not going to usually be. No, luckily, my vampires are pretty cheap. Like I, I start with, uh, like on average, like a five and play two fours. Sure. So. Well, that's that's pretty neat. So, uh, are there any of the games that you would like to talk about that were particularly interesting, or uh, before the final? We'll talk about the final here in a minute, but anything that was kind of a standout example of how rivals is kind of unique or different um, and, and why it appeals to you. I'd love to talk about one or two. Uh, yeah. My third round, uh, I'd say uh, like at, right when the game ended, the, uh, the person to my right uh, end of the game and won. And like, I think we all revealed our hands afterwards and like all of us had the win on the turn like no one was getting yeah that, that was probably like one of the closest games i played the whole weekend uh like a, everybody was in it and everybody had a chance at winning even um so when i play test partners our vampire deck was one card different mm -hmm. and we were at the table twice over the weekend like once in the swiss and once in the top 16 and uh -huh. he ended up uh based on turnover going after me and so he was having a rough time like on um and the top 16, like his first three discards were my three vampires I had on the table. Like he had to draw like way past. Oh, jeez. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in both of those games, like he was still able to stay in and be competitive. Like the, uh, he was a turn away from winning as well the first time, even though like we had a lot of vampire overlap. So that, that was good. The unique role didn't really hurt him that bad. Maybe it's because like we don't rely like on a single guy as much. Sure. I think it'll be interesting too. I mean, Gen Con happened in a in a world where a lot of people I don't think got to play test a huge amount, uh, especially not in multiplayer. You know, unless they're they're really working hard to play virtually with people or things like that, just due to the state of the world. Uh, and you know, you really couldn't net deck anything. You you couldn't you could not come up with you know a tournament winning deck and show up. So it was kind of the wild west. I'm very curious to see if now we see the sort of anti-meta, you know, trying to pick vampires that are not going to be picked elsewhere in order to not have that problem. Uh, that's one of the things that is most intriguing to me about Rivals because it's, it's a rule that I've never encountered in any of the other card games that I've played. And I think from what you've said about your experience, it's not been a factor for you either. Uh, but you think it doesn't, it, for your strategy, it wasn't a huge hindrance or worry? uh no i mean i i think the trick is for mine was to at least have like enough variety in my routes because uh my two wins in the swiss were actually by elimination not even by money drain okay like yeah defeating all the vampires um which i mean at the end of the day if you can turn sideways and defeat a vampire that's the way to go just because it's advancing every win condition you could possibly have like sure. it's getting you closer to knocking all the guys out it's making them lose a dollar and giving you a vp so sure yeah, you want to be able to do that in some way shape or form and and i think it's pretty important let me know if you agree in rivals like you have to have at least two different ways you can win that game for you money drain or coterie elimination mm -hmm. it, it seems really unwise to have a one trick pony deck Oh yeah, for sure. Because uh, like if you're money draining and you're going against somebody who's just turtling and gaining money, you're they're gonna outrace you. Like yeah. Uh, or if there's like a, a deck that just sits back and grinds out VP, like it's maybe in their favor unless the table interferes. Uh, yeah, and especially with some of the new cards coming and ways to increase secrecy and things that like you don't want to have to be discarding two or three cards to attack into someone's haven every time. Because uh, a lot of decks, you, you won't have the cards to do that as well as play your attack cards and stuff. I think I think the deck that was my favorite to see during the Swiss uh, was one that we only talked about like theoretically was the Dragon Roost, the Blockhouse, where you can like move your leader into the streets and block. Yeah, uh, 
Uh, and I think Karasu was doing that with Aurora and Heightened Senses. So like he had a lot of interaction with what the rest of the table was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, luckily in our game, I was going right before him. So usually like when it got back around to me, like she was already burnt and spent so I could kind of do what I wanted. <laughs> and then Hunt, Hunt the Hunter is also kind of, I guess with your secondary strategy being to get a, go for a coterie kill, Hunt the Hunters is a pretty easy pick for agenda because if you can kill a vampire, you can probably also kill a sad. Yeah, especially with, uh, I mean, Lishu with anybody on her. Uh, you just have to get to three with a House of Pain on your leader and you're getting one a turn. Uh, that's also why I have three Beauty as a Beast in two to like, get up to the numbers you want there. Well, so that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, let's talk about the finals. So uh, you guys had... I believe two hunt the hunters, a playthings, and was it base of power was the fourth one? I have this document open. Um, it was the title one. Yeah, yeah um, base of power. Uh, how how did that sort of shape up? And you know, what what was your what was your rival? What was the agenda of our of your rival? Do you know? Um, yeah, see, I hunters, believe the that. Uh, the rival setup was uh, the person next to me and myself were going after each other and across the table they were going after each other it it, it was a long weekend so i'm sorry yeah. if i'm wrong but, That's okay. um, uh, so the the game uh unfolded where the uh start of the game i put the leash out and made him pay an extra dollar mm -hmm. uh, it was both the rival and uh, the guy who was going after me and the guy I was going after. So it was probably Heath, because uh, Heath was running Li Shu in there as his first slot for Vampire. So I'm guessing that was your, uh, yeah. your rival. And then uh, he ended up dropping the Bruja six cost and smoke. So uh, right off the bat there, uh, he was down to like four bucks. Oh, geez. Right after those three are out and the extra dollar I made him pay. Yep. Now, he, he did end up uh, draining a dollar or two off me uh, with biting comment. Um, and it got to the point where I had three vampires and he knocked two of them out. So I was down to one. Okay. So the, the table kind of worried that he was about to win just by eliminating me. Uh, I was going after him, so... Uh, after he went and knocked my two guys out, uh, I played another, and uh, at the end of that turn, drew two defense cards, like two insanity defenses, which, oh. which are probably as good as I can get for a defense card. Sure. Uh, so, like, I, I'm able to like relax a bit and know that I'm not gonna, about to get knocked out. Even if he comes after you, you have the tool. Right now, to stay at. the other two at the table didn't know this, and, and uh, neither did he. So they're. They're like intent on, um, you know, keeping me alive by, you know, taking out, I think they took out Lishu and maybe Smoke as well. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they wanted to take out both. And I was like, you could probably be fine. Like, I'm probably fine if you just take out Lishu. Like, I was trying to downplay it, but. Sure. Not like, and and for to... people who are, too, if you're tuning in your newer to Rivals, uh, this is relevant because if Josh's rival had knocked him out, that rival would win the game. So the players who are not involved in that back and forth, they are incentivized to keep Josh in while they continue to advance their win condition. So it's kind of a, it's an interesting uh, foible of the four player multiplayer aspect that you kind of had these guys coming to your defense. And they, um, so he was also low on money and they were worried that I was going to maybe knock him out by money, but like he survived for a lot of turns on low money. So I think that kind of like left their brain. They, they weren't as worried about it. Gotcha. Uh, I fell down to the trying to, I'm trying to finagle getting another dominate on the table because most of my money drain in my hand need to dominate. Sure. Um, so eventually when my guys came out of torpor, like the next turn, it came around and I won. But before that, we were, we were kind of able to, as a table, like point at somebody and say, oh, they're about to win. And everyone hurry up and gang up on them. Oh, they're about to win. Everyone hurry up and gang up on them. And luckily, like, because they were afraid I was going to get eliminated. I feel like, you know, the, the threat from my end of the table, like 
it was either forgotten about or there was nothing they could do about it. So they just kind of hoped I didn't have it in my hand. Yeah, yeah. Which at the end of the day, sometimes you have to do, right? Yep. Um, and the other Hunt the Hunters uh, deck, Sid, who's actually uh, my Airbnb mate for the weekend. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. Our room had half the final table there. Uh, he was probably going to win on his turn when it came around uh, via prestige, via points. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Agenda? You mean? On his agenda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So did you find when, when you had, you know, two hunt the hunters at a table like that, was it, was, it would be harder to score your hunt the hunters points because they are getting shut. They're, they're going to the deck and then coming back out, but they don't come back out. In, eh, I guess if you're down out and if you're out of the deck, they're coming right back up. Unless yeah, we, uh, the game had gone long enough where the only four cards in the deck were sads. So there was just, they were just there. Sure. If one got knocked out, then they were just back. Right. Um, we hit uh, the event reshuffle, which slowed that down. But it was it was to the point where it was inevitable. Like th there was a, a turn where the player going right before said like came up and overextended to knock us out and hopefully another one didn't flip. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one did anyways. Also, uh, Sid was on the uh, Tidal Haven that lets you like discard a card to draw Royal a new retreat card. looks like yeah yeah uh, discard a card to draw a new card from the uh, the event deck so he was able to find the sads pretty much no matter what we were doing to him anyway so <laughs> yeah I think it's just interesting seeing you know two decks with hunt the hunters but with quite different vampires with different uh, uh, havens and different play styles I think that's one of the things that's kind of cool as we see the game now played in a little bit wider arena. You're seeing more different ways to use the same tools or some of the same tools. And that's kind of fun. Well, that's, that's awesome. It was a great tournament. Uh, I think that one, one thing that I was very impressed with is just everybody seemed to show great sportsmanship, you know, patience, uh, a lot of welcome, welcomingness to new players because you know, we did have some people who were brand new or or maybe who'd had the game since Kickstarter, but hadn't had a lot of opponents to play with just due again to the fact that there's a pandemic on. Uh, so like, thank you to you and everybody else who played for being such great sports and making it such a successful event. Uh, but of course, as the prince, you're going to be a card in the game. Do you have any thoughts on what sort of card you would want to be? What sort of thing? Uh, I mean, part of me definitely wants to be like at least a five cost. So uh, I'm like a legitimate starting choice. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was already a joke. Like people are going to outbid me for me. And um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm still absorbing the uh, the two expansions I picked up over the weekend. Uh, even think like what I'd want. I'm, I'm just happy to be in it, honestly. Like, Do you have a clan? Even, even even if he ends up being a bad card, I'll still play him. <laughs> <laughs> you have a clan preference or anything? If you could pick, um, either uh, Banu Hakim or La Samba were always my two favorite in the RPG. Okay. Uh, my my longest played character would have been a Banu Hakim, uh, but I also really like La Samba, so probably probably one of those two is is what I lean towards. That's cool. Well, well, I am looking forward. It's been really neat to work with artists to do the Victor Temple and uh, Annabelle cards that we did for the LA by Nightcast. Uh, it, you know, I'm not an artist, so seeing someone take a real person and you know they're there, the aspects of their character, and just make it into a card, and they do it so quickly sometimes, I just think is really impressive. So I'm excited to see what uh, what becomes of your card. And then figure out where we want to put that so that people can get their hands on it and you know have you on the table uh, but we will begin that process here getting some pictures for you real soon and hopefully have something to show off sooner rather than later because i don't want to leave you guys waiting you know interminably to see what you're going to be uh, when it comes um, to a vampire i'm also really hoping it'll help me like drum up a local meta like oh hey everybody i'm going to teach you this game by the way <laughs> <laughs> Well, we will definitely make sure that when your card is is ready, that we'll send you a stack of them. So, you know, yeah, I think it's a cool thing and, and like a really fun idea. If somebody plays you at, you know, next gen con or something, 
that you can say, oh, hey, like great game here. Here's my promo card, you know, from me. Just a cool way to sort of have yeah, even with uh even with like the my star wars card design like i had a bunch of people like hit me up for cards that never even touched the game like oh yeah my friend has a card so yeah that's 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 a really cool uh it's a cool prize and i hope that people you know are motivated and and enjoy getting to see these people who have sort of put their mark on the game show up in the game um but josh i won't keep you too much longer thank you for joining me and chatting about this uh thanks for playing uh, any advice to people who are considering attending a larger tournament like this? You know, any words of uh, encouragement or things to keep in mind? Uh, I mean, I think the biggest thing is like, don't get discouraged or uh, like defeat yourself in your head ahead of time. Uh, I, I kind of had it easy in this event where uh, I ended up winning the, the first round table. So mm -hmm. like all stress was like kind of gone because I think we figured out beforehand, like six points would get you in. And I felt like my deck was pretty resilient to getting like eliminated at the table. So like, sure. uh, even if you don't get something like that, like just if you can find a way just to do in without stress uh, and you can kind of make sure, you know, you don't make a mistake out of, you know, just out of brain. An unforced fatigue. error because you're panicky or you're just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, just relax. Uh, and especially in this game, like try to get the table talk going. Like sometimes it'll let you win games you have no business winning if if people are uh, you know busy paying attention to the rest of the table sure. uh, and even if you you know even if you're not gonna win yourself you know maybe the person who knocked your vampires out maybe you can keep them from winning you know like, sure and I don't know but let's have fun with it at the end of the at the end of the day it's a game though make make sure you're playing what you have fun with absolutely that that's I think a thing that is very important even outside of this game where, you know, net decking's going to maybe get you in trouble if everybody else is thinking the same thing. The play style of the different clans is so different. Like find what's fun to you and get practice with that and play that. Like don't play the thing that is just supposed to be the best because you're going to run into uniqueness issues and it's just not going to be as, as energizing and fun for you. So. And people are going to know your deck when you sit down. That too. Yeah. That too. Well, awesome, Josh. Congratulations again. Thanks for coming to Gen Con. And I hope that we see you at a future Prince of the City event, uh, you know, That's at, the plan. Uh, hobnobbing with the other royalty. Yeah, I mean, maybe not the West Coast, but maybe some of the East Coast ones. Sounds good. All right. Well, have a, have a great night. And everyone, we'll be back next week for Vampire Wednesday with a look at the uh, Wolf and the Rat expansion, some of those cards with Matt Hyra. So until then, have a great night and have a great night, Josh. Thanks.